It's stuck. Yes. Got it. Yep. And now I'll admit everyone. Okay. Welcome everybody uh, to our May seminar for the Global Encounters Monash program. So it's my absolute thrill tonight to be introducing you to Matt Pohl. But before we do, I'll just acknowledge that I'm, me, I'm coming to you today from the unceded lands of Nam, better known as Melbourne, the home of the Wurundjeri, the Woiwurrung and Bunurong peoples and the members of the Kulin Nation, both traditional owners and custodians of the land. Matt uh, is going to be talking to us tonight uh, about Shaped by the Sea uh, the, at the National Maritime Museum. Matt's the recently appointed manager of Indigenous programs at the Australian National Maritime Museum. And I'm really thrilled to say that it's also, uh, this is the start of a collaboration that we're doing with the National Maritime Museum and with Matt around uh, uh, some of the work that the Global Encounters program's working on. So it's an absolute thrill. I've been a huge fan of Matt's work for a long time. Um, he's he's quite, uh, qu quite the polymath in lots of ways. And I think uh, this is gonna be a real treat tonight. So welcome Matt and thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Just got my screen up. Thanks so much, Lynette. Um, I'm calling in today from the unceded Wangul lands of the Eora Nation of Greater Sydney. I'd like to acknowledge uh, their continuing custodianship of country. And I'd also like to acknowledge all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations whose work I will be referencing, drawing examples from and speaking about tonight. It's an incredible honor to always work with indigenous knowledges and I'm very privileged, I know. <laughs> um, Wow, thanks so much. I um, started at the Maritime Museum just over six months ago now, so I jumped pretty well into the deep end into the final stages of a multi-year project that's been in development for quite a while. Um, the new exhibition for the permanent galleries on the ground floor of the museum is a new exhibition space called Shaped by the Sea. Uh, uh, entirely collection works. The National Maritime Museum is only really around 30 years old. So we have a quite well provenanced and very contemporary focused collection. And it's been a steep learning curve, but a really fantastic opportunity to um, shift it up a bit from previous collections that I've worked with. So still really enjoying and loving it so much. The exhibition opens in July and being a permanent exhibition space, it should be open for the next few years. Um, I guess one of the new things for me through working here is, you know, we're a nationally focused museum. We're actually one of the few, one of the only national museums outside of Canberra. Um, and the, the idea of um, sea country, you know, and I'd like to acknowledge sea country, you know, the, the waters off Australia. Um, you know, ever since the land rights movement in the early 1970s, we've seen this groundswell of amazing community activism around the idea of land rights. But um, the Maritime Museum has a very interesting remit in that case, uh, working with Australia's coastlines, our rivers, estuaries, even our inland waterways too, is something that is a, a really interesting way to acknowledge the marine environments. And um, you know, simple things like, you know, once the low tide mark all around Australia is actually Commonwealth territories um, outside of the state's responsibilities to particular areas. And we have this network of um, the seas and the Pacific and Indian Ocean and Great Southern Ocean contact, uh, which um, of course is something that is an incredibly um, profound aspect of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges. So it's a little bit daunting to think about how to go about this, but to think of um, sea country as an extension of our, of our understanding of land rights, and you know, to even take that a little step further to think about sky worlds, um, we're starting to see you know, a real new sophistication sort of in the way that we see how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges are embedded in the spaces which we all move through. 
Um, and there's a lot of backstory to the idea of shaped by the sea. When you see, um, you know, one of the most amazing things about Sydney, which I think is a very underexplored story, is the um, it's at, in Karingai National Park in the northern beaches of Sydney. We actually have um, one of the largest outdoor rock engraving galleries on the whole east coast of Australia. You know, that gives you all sorts of background to this idea of you know how people occupied the greater Sydney basin over millennia. But the fascinating thing with the more than 2000 sites, which I think have been catalogued and any of these sites can have any, anything up to several hundred uh, motifs inside one engraving site. Um, but the statistical overview of this, of those sites that people have done has shown that more than 50% of the rock engravings are actually about marine creatures and sea life. Um, great whale feasts. Um, there's a beautiful statement by a community member about, you know, when you approach a rock at site, you're actually approaching a sacred, sacred ground. You know, these, these, these rock engravings have purpose. And one of the longer term projects that I'd like to sort of initiate through our networks across um, through the Maritime Museum is a deeper exploration of uh, what these rock engraving sites can actually mean for the contemporary community. And I'll get to another example a little later about a contemporary artist working with that. But um, if you're ever coming through Sydney, I think one of the best ways to experience that um, the deeper layers of history, it's a public art gallery there that a lot of sites are actually protected, but a lot of the other ones which are managed by National Parks and Wildlife are actually designed to guide uh, you know tourists and interested visitors towards particular uh, spaces which are maintained and when you when you approach these sites you just get this sense of leaving the city behind and exploring um, this um, this incredible um, legacy which was left by these artists um, not to mention the other amazing story of you know what some of them may sort of be mean or telling us um, because there's a really great opportunity there. Um, you know, we're all a bit familiar with the, the recent 250th anniversary of a particular East Coast journey. But when you, these are some amazing photos that I luckily just came across today from the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife site showing the beginning of the end of the, the whale migrations as they're passing by Sydney. And when you look at some of the rock engravings showing the occasions and the event, and even some of the earlier, um, colonial records of the whale feasts happening in places like Manly and other sort of areas, not to mention the beautiful stories of community um, members standing on cliff tops, um, singing to the whales. Um, there's this really interesting connection of the story of the east coast of Australia and, you know, these, um, uh, the, the knowledges from whether they're related to seasonal knowledges or you know whether they whether these uh, whales were looked at in the sort of an ancestral context, there's a beautiful way, layer of knowledge there that connects all of the East Coast Australian uh, Aboriginal communities up until Harvey Bay, um, <clears throat> and this was explored most recently in a really amazing artwork by the artist Nicole Monks, uh, Yamaji artist from uh, Western Australia, who's worked predominantly in Sydney for a number of years. And it just goes to show how contemporary art is this really great lens to explore uh, Aboriginal knowledges. Um, you know, there's a simple direct reiteration of rock engravings, which you see in some sort of spaces. But I think this is one of the most amazing artworks. It was one of the opening events for Shape by the Sea, I think in 2018 or 2019, sorry, on um, Sculpture by the Sea, sorry, not Shape by the Sea. Um, which happens in the Bondi Coastal Walk, a site that actually has a several uh, rock engravings still extant today. And this is a whale shark rock engraving, which was transformed into a performative activated artwork. Um, the outline of the rock engraving was turned into this beautiful um, sculpture. Well, you know, it's considered a sculpture, but it's an ephemeral sculpture is the word I was looking for. Um, and two community elders, Uncle Charles Madden, and I think another elder on the day actually participated in the, the lighting of this outline of the rock engraving figure of the whale shark, um, creating, you know, an event 
um, a site, a coming together of people, um, something which you see depicted in the rock engravings in some cases as well. Um, so this story of the sea and the way that people's lives are shaped by the sea is something that we've been um, exploring through the way that this exhibition has come together. There's a lot of uh, non-Indigenous knowledges interspersed with First Nations knowledges as they're represented in the exhibition. And it's certainly not about um, contesting ideas, it's about parallel visions. It's about um, showing the stewardship of country and the layers of environmental knowledges and knowledges even of the deep past, which are represented in the way that oral histories and performances preserve knowledge and transmit that knowledge to future generations. That is a, um, a exciting, but very challenging um, aspect to try and explore. Um, I guess the other impetus, which sort of was a background for the Shape by the the exhibition was the Gapu Monarch exhibition of the saltwater bark paintings from Yurikala. Uh, Jambawa Marawili initiated one of the, the first sort of extension of that concept of land rights through the saltwater bark paintings and the saltwater case. Um, this is a very brief background. There was a um, desecration of Baru, the ancestral uh, crocodile by some fishermen, at, which occurred at a very sacred site in Blue Mud Bay. Um, the paintings that were produced, um, produced almost as legal documents, showed the living title, you know, the aesthetics of the reflections of, on water, um, showed that the, the um, Yolnu people's um, stewardship and custodianship of sea rights extended past the coast, far out to sea. Um, and the knowledges contained in the saltwater bark paintings um, are this incredible extension of um, the, the Yolnu peoples specifically um, understanding of the role, not to mention the, the beautiful conceptual way that they brought this story to life, you know, the Duwa Yiritja, the freshwater, saltwater, um, you know, some of the paintings describe clouds forming at the bottom of the ocean and, you know, rising up. Um, there's this beautiful cyclic circular nature, you know, everything is telling us who we are, um, that is embodied, embodied in this collection. And it was actually a really important uh, consultation tool for myself at the time when I was working on the uh, Jalkery exhibition at Chow Chuck Wing. We brought community elders down to show how this, how an exhibition can map out country, um, how it extends, how, how, to, how to group paintings. You know, some need to be shown flat. Some need to be shown on the walls. Um, it was a, a real learning experience um, to, to build upon some of these really great exhibitions that have happened. I mean, we can look back to encounters in 2015, 2016 from the British Museum that came to Australia. And I think that set a new sort of precedent in relation to exhibitions. Um, I can probably list several at most of our institutions since that time, the Australian Museum, the National Gallery of Victoria, where this new way of um, juxtaposing um, historical objects and museum objects um, alongside and using contemporary art as a vehicle to interpret the contemporary layers of information surrounding those objects signals a really interesting way that museum exhibitions are not just going out with the old fashioned, capturing information, storing it, uh, representing it in ways which sort of don't, which block out that voice of community authorship and the moral rights of the artists and community members whose knowledge is being represented. Um, you know, the simple act of using indigenous language to name objects and to um, delineate themes and concepts within exhibition spaces is a huge step forward into the way that museums create, you know, created a separation between, um, you know, what was a museum constructed Aboriginal past and the contemporary lived experience of community members. And I think we've carried on a lot of these conversations and discussions that came out of Gapu Monarch and, you know, through watching other broader shifts happening across the museum field in Australia, which in some ways is um, shaping the way that many other First Nations uh, culture is being represented in museums around the world. It's a fascinating space at the moment. And um, 
I think we've really listened more than anything and tried to really develop that into the Shaped by the Sea exhibition. Um, being um, the Maritime Museum as well, we um, have incredible stories to explore. Um, the story of the the bombing of the Patricia Cam in 1943 um, off the coast of the Wessel Islands, for example, um, shows that Aboriginal people were, you know, defending their coastlines. Uh, one of the people who was on the Patricia Cam, uh, Narachan May Muru, um, an incredible um, spokesperson, leader for the Yurikala community. He was one of the, he established the Mulka Center in the 1960s, for example, but he was actually on the Patricia Cam when it was bombed, um, you know, rescued people. It was him and a, and a couple of other men who walked uh, more than two days to notify the missions. Um, you know, there was a missionary who was taken prisoner of war from that bombing of the Patricia Cam as well. Um, when you do consultations out on country, you learn these deeper historical events and see that there's these deeper um, respect that needs to be paid to people's um, um, stewardship of their own country. Um, and descendants of Narajan actually produced works which were in the saltwater bark painting uh, exhibition as well. So there is this intergenerational um, preservation of country, which comes through in a lot of the, the contemporary works which is being preserved today. You can see generations of um, family members who have con all contributed um, such an incredibly generous um, message to um, firstly, many other First Nations people around Australia, and secondly, to the wider non-Indigenous community about the need to um, care for country and to listen to country and to represent country in a very protocol bound and um, important uh, method, I guess. Um, so that's just a little bit of the backstory of where the, the where different projects that the museum have done have led into and to the concept of the shaped by the sea. Um, with the release of the new curriculum, it's a very timely um, intersection as well, where uh, the concepts of deep time are sort of embedded in the, uh, I think it's the primary to year 10 curriculum as a, as a, a permanent subject. Um, but how do you teach it? How do you represent it in a museum? You know, it's quite difficult to, um, to imagine a thousand years into the future, let alone a thousand years into the past. Um, things change, um, historical knowledges uh, uh, get overwritten and changed and redeveloped. There, um, but to be able to start with this story of um, continental Australia, how even the shape of the coastline, which we take for granted today, did not exist at the time when Aboriginal people were first um, spreading across the continent in these great um, intergenerational migrations. Um, as, as each year goes, we see more and more amazing research, which is adding different um, parts of the story, but also challenging the way that we've been taught as well. Um, when you look at Sahul, for example, and the way that Papua New Guinea and uh, mainland Australia of today were connected at the time, what does that mean when you find um, like a stone tool artifact, for example, that's more than 65,000 years old? Where is that in distribution of knowledge coming from? Um, you know, those borders which we all take for granted today evaporate. Um, you know, people who witnessed the creation of the Gulf, you know, generations of people who um, responded to the creation of the Gulf of Carpentaria, environmental refugees as such in different time periods, which have shaped people's migrations to other parts of the country. Um, not to mention the amazing underwater archaeology research which is happening and finding evidence of stone tool manufacture off the coast of Western Australia, for example, and several other places is something that um, gives us a new narrative tool when talking about the past. Um, and, you know, it shows in a really fascinating way that um, the, 
the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge is just the the five minutes to midnight type aspect of this deeper geological past. Um, so other aspects of the shape, but I'm actually only concentrating on the indigenous cultural knowledges which I've worked on for this exhibition, but you'll find um, uh, geological samples uh, from Gondwana land in the exhibition space, for example, um, scientific uh, instrumentation, which we use to um, map the ocean floor. Um, there's another completely different element of the Shaped by the Sea story, um, which sits alongside the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural knowledges which are represented in the exhibition. Um, just briefly, to even think of some of the other amazing um, knowledges which are coming out of things like Lapita cultural dispersion, pushing it back towards the southern edges of Papua New Guinea and possibly Cape York from recent research that's coming out. Um, there's different ways that we need to speak about the past and museum exhibitions have a very important role to be at the intersection of that. I mean, one of our largest um, audience communities with the Maritime Museum is school audiences. So to be able to give people those little bits, little tools and little pieces of information which give them the confidence to speak about um, deep time in Australia and to also learn some of the deeper connections to country which are represented through Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges is probably the most, the most important outcome from the work that we're doing. <clears throat> so yeah, there's um, several elements which look at the fossil record, for example, um, trying to get into teach ideas of Pangaea and Panthalassa. Um, it's a really important way of um, looking at the past, but it's also incredibly challenging as I was saying before. So how do we, um, how do, we do that? Um, firstly, it's through looking at the way that indigenous knowledges represent these environmental responses to country. Um, there's no shortage of incredible examples which are drawn through contemporary art, for example, but there's also uh, knowledges embedded in the materialistic record, um, you know, bone, shell, wood, um, the different speciation of wood, how people are using their environment to nav firstly navigate their environment, but also to thrive in their environment is in a, just one of the most remarkable stories to tell. It's a, as a branch of humanity, the story of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's um, resilience and ingenuity in relation to how they responded to their world um, over who knows how many generations is um, something that we can do so much better. And I hope that the new Shape by the Sea exhibition signals a new um, direction for museology in that sense, in terms of, over, of adding these layers of knowledge to existing bodies of knowledge. <clears throat> At the heart of the um, Shape by the Sea exhibition is an incredible new installation from the Mulka Center, Dunan Dukka. Um, this is a multi-channel video installation. It has a larikage pole at the center, which is actually a projection screen. Um, there's the incredible, um, I really can't even describe it, the, the 3D mapping type work that the Mulka Center technicians um, produce, which is, um, the actual heart of the exhibition as such, there's a really beautiful design, which the way that the exhibition has been put together, which creates these general sort of thematic, quite loose thematic concepts like land, sky, water. Um, but at the heart of that is every when. And there's actually designed to sort of push audiences through the space, almost as if they're water. There's like little eddies where people can sort of dig since spend more time, um, you know, looking and learning. Um, and there's other ways to actually experience the show as sort of, you know, walking through it, navigating it as such. So there's a very important um, conceptual background to the actual layout of the space, which I think is in quite important. And it's something which is also comes from the way that um, the protocols around 
relationships between different Aboriginal nations, for example. Um, there's so many ways I could go into in the way that um, working with Indigenous knowledges reshapes collection policies or you know, even collection storage methods, exhibition uh, practices, um, you know, greeting uh, audiences into the museum or into the exhibition, you know, welcoming people into spaces. I think, you know, Australian museology in this case has um, been quite good at listening more so than trying to heavy handedly overwrite the stories which we're trying to represent. Um, it's just some more background into like the flow of the exhibition space. Um, but yeah, to have this Yol Yolnu um, uh, Danan Dukar at the heart of the exhibition, um, I think also pays tribute to the generosity of spirit that Yolnu people have had in terms of helping so many other uh, First Nations uh, and language groups around the country in their cultural revitalization practices. You know, as people like John Mundine have said, you know, um, heritage is in people, it's not in objects. And um, through the remarkable stories of people like Wanjak Marika, who was the chair of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Arts Board, um, you can trace these amazing um, stories and um, experiences of contemporary artists, for example, spending time in the art centers around Arnhem Land and bringing those knowledges of community protocol and practice back in and representing those knowledges in ways which are relevant to their communities, you know, especially in the Southeast. Um, <clears throat> so it's incredible to <clears throat> have um, an Indigenous knowledge uh, representation created by um, an art centre as remarkable as the Mulka Centre, which is in some ways the the linchpin of so many other aspects of the exhibition. Um, another incredibly beautiful um, object, which is one of the signature objects of this exhibition. And if you visit the museum in the second half of this year, you'll actually be able to see uh, Alec Tapote's solo exhibition, Mirar Mineral, um, in conjunction with Shape by the Sea. Um, this sculpture, Kisse Dangle, as um, been something that's been an incredible learning experience for me. You know, the in the lino prints and in, especially in this sculptural work, the the patterns as a language. Um, you know, the pearl shell and you know the history of early Torres Strait Islander pearl shell um, industries, which predate those of Broome, for example. Um, you know, it was ever, it was Torres Strait Islander knowledges that brought the first pearlers to that part of the country. Um, and an artist as incredible as Alec, who is uh, a cultural leader in relation to language revitalization in Zened Keds, um, which I've got, got a little map there, a new terminology that many Torres Strait Islander artists in particular are using to, to name their country, shows you as well, um, um, you know, Alec's work depicts, you know, winds or turtle, uh, nesting areas or dugong hunting grounds. Um, it shows you the, the map of the Torres Strait um, is so interconnected and is also um, an incredible metaphor for the way we think of our own nation amongst other nations as well, I think. Um, as a side note, you, there's just so many interesting stories that come out of you trying to just write a simple paragraph label and you end up spending three days going down these amazing research <laughs> trips. Um, thankfully with the resources of the Vaughan Evans Library, for example, at the Maritime Museum, I've been really exploring the, the wreck of the Charles Eaton in the 1840s. This, um, you know, entryways into, from the east into the Torres Strait um, are quite dangerous. Um, it wasn't really until the Admiralty chart was made in the late 1800s that many ships felt safe to even go through there. And one of the first um, major shipwrecks that occurred in the Torres Strait um, on Orid Island, um, there was at least 17 people whose remains ended up adorning a massive turtle shell mask and uh, several ships had reported it. Um, there was a big rescue effort. I mean, I'd like to actually look at this in some sort of concept as being one of the first repatriations that took place in Australia. 
Um, I think it was Governor Burke who ordered that these remains be recovered from the Orid Islanders and um, brought back to Sydney. This is the uh, tombstone which was commemorating the the reinterment of those remains, which were um, from the people from the wreck of the Charles Eaton. Um, and, you know, it's a remarkable story. We don't really understand or have the tools in our um, schools, for example, to explore the different relationships as they've existed and, you know, the impacts of the colonial expansion. Uh, the, the maritime history associated with the colonization of Australia is an incredibly different layer to the, the overland explorers, for example. And once we start to actually think of the, the maritime colonization experience, there's, a, there's an interesting new space which opens up in terms of um, not only historical knowledges, but um, understanding the role that Indigenous people as have guided um, and used the oceans as a defense to different areas. Um, and this ties back into another important um, collection area from the Maritime Museum. Um, been incredibly worked, the privilege to follow up on some of the work which was done by um, curators such as David Payne over the years, who has created these, he's an incredible drafts person himself, but also done these remarkable um, overviews of the, the types of indigenous watercraft as they exist. And there's this real amazing revivalism project happening in many parts of the country. It's a cooperative effort, um, you know, where do you get the knowledges of sourcing um, the bark for tide bark canoes? Um, you know, exploring the, the international influences of hollow log lipper lipper, um, you know, canoes from the northern coast. The way that our southern waters are so, um, have surf, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, whereas the northern parts of our continent um, don't have that surf and how does that impact boat design um, and watercraft design? Um, you get an, you start to get a bit of a glimpse of how um, the watercraft are a type of experiential knowledge. They are knowledges of not only materials and the protocols necessary to access different materials in different parts of the country amongst First Nations people, but they're an agglomeration of these incredible knowledges. You know, um, the the use of resins as waterproofing agents, for example. Um, not as just binding. Um, the different types of rope making which goes into the lashings associated with different watercraft. Um, in some ways, understanding the watercraft is a really interesting entry point into understanding um, people's mobility, um, especially when you look on the inland waterways. I mean, they, most of these rivers acted as superhighways between different uh, nations. You can trace the distribution of not just trade networks, but knowledges shifting through, connected by these uh, waterways in the inland area. Um, there's, apart from the Torres Strait, there's, and North Queensland, um, there's not much watercraft in the Southeast, for example, which go out into open ocean, for example. But there are descriptions of people taking them out past the breakwaters in places like Maroubra and places like that in Sydney. So, um, not to mention the incredible work of people like Keith Vincent Smith, which have tracked um, not only Aboriginal convicts, um, but Aboriginal people working on ships, um, visiting um, different uh, parts of the colonies at those times. You know, the remarkable story of Bungaree, the first Aboriginal man that we know of to navigate, circumnavigate the entire continent. Um, in one aspect of Shaped by the Sea, it's to have this new space where we can uh, display five different types of watercraft. Um, so there's in the in your top right, I think this is an Arnhem Land. Um, two different, well, the top are two different types of Arnhem Land: the tide bark canoe and the the more raft type. Um, this is a Bardi raft in the bottom left corner, produced by. Um, in West in uh, Broome, Western Australia, and this new commission, which we worked with an incredible artist based in Southern Tasmania, uh, Sheldon Thomas, to recreate a ninger for us. Um, 
the uh, paper bark canoe used by Luritwia um, people. Um, and, you know, to be able to show this diversity or well, a glimpse of some of the diversity as it exists in relation to Indigenous watercraft, to have the space to actually do that is incredibly important and um, something that I think the design of the exhibition space, I can't really show you any images yet because the show is some completed installation, but I'm hopefully giving you a bit of a teaser to come and actually understand how this works in the space itself. Um, you know, it's an important part of Sydney's history as well. We're uh, discussing with several communities in the south coast of New South Wales, Sydney and western New South Wales, and hopefully other parts of the country when we can travel a bit more freely about um, adding so many more to the Maritime Museum's register of historic vessels, almost creating a new category in the register of historic vessels, which can um, give us this impetus to record all the knowledges and to do interviews with makers, contemporary makers of these craft um, and preserve these knowledges for future generations. I think there's a huge hunger out there amongst especially younger community members to learn, um, not just the, the watercraft making techniques, but how else did they work with them? Um, this is another project where we made Tide um, that I worked on for the Westmead Hospital project to sort of use these knowledges of watercraft to create um, benches um, to, to just add this um, space, um, add, add these types of knowledges into the way that we create social spaces. Um, <clears throat> because, yeah, starting from the watercraft, then we can start to look to these amazing, um, you know, technologies which people developed, eel traps, barramundi traps, um, the different types of um, fishing knowledges, so it was important, I think, in some ways too, to not uh, bring as archaeological fish hooks, which are quite common in the Sydney region, for example, into the exhibition space, but to work with local knowledge holders about creating contemporary artworks as responses to these uh, fish hooks. So we were incredibly fortunate to work with an amazing community member, Sharon Mason. Um, based in Naruma, but who also has connections to La Perouse. Um, and for her to create this installation of around 67 um, abalone fish hook shells, um, which are sort of artistic representations of the type of knowledges which were used. Um, you know, there's amazing research being done about the differences in fish hooks in uh, Northeast Australia versus Southeast Australia, you know, what possible influences they had um, you know, when they first appear in the record, where did they come from? Um, I think a lot of communities have these knowledges, but they're not in the, um, they're not accessible in the way that we would think of them as researchers. Um, so, you know, to start from that historical in baseline of especially archaeological knowledges, but then also bring it back and to to draw upon the amazing reclamative projects which are happening all across Australia. So this is another one which is being launched in Sydney just in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Judy Watson's um, Berra, the fish hook made out of Carrara marble. Um, and it's a fascinating way that a lot of these, what we, what I'm trying not to say, are uh, new developments were actually foreshadowed by a lot of different um, uh, academics and people over the years. So um, the way that, you know, archaeology has this tendency to monumentalize the past is something that we need to be very cautious of too. It's important to work with living knowledges and living community members. And I think we've um, been able to do that through the examples that we've done with Sheldon Thomas and his uh, Ninga watercraft and, and Sharon Mason's uh, contemporary fish hook production that's, that's installation which she created for the exhibition. Um, another amazing project um, we were able to get off the ground was working with the Yidinji dancers of um, Cairns. This is a shoot that we did at um, Brampton Beach. And it's a story of um, sea level rise. Um, it's a massive five channel video installation and I'm not doing it justice at all. You'd be much better off seeing the ex exhibition, the video installation in situ. Um, but essentially it's about, you know, 
breaking the law and you know the spearing of this stingray out on the reefs a site where we the we know scientifically that the water was uh, the water line was further out closer to where the reefs are now but through the the breaking of protocol the stingray flapped its wings and pushed the um water further up onto the land um these uh oral histories which are preserving knowledges of um uh, ancient coastlines, you know, and that's really nothing to be um, underestimated, just how um, not fragile those knowledges are, but just how precarious they are and how we really need to be listening to First Nations elders and creating spaces for non-traditional research formats, which may be in the, you know, the interrogation of um, dance or song or different sort of areas of, which contain knowledge and safely unpacking them in a way which allows community members to build on their ancestral knowledges and in some cases bring that knowledge to wider national and international audiences. Um, I'm getting a bit over time so I'll just quickly briefly go through some of the other highlights. Um, you know the amazing possum skin cloaks and if you've ever seen the one from 1839 which is in the Smithsonian Museum collection and to see the brilliant patterning, which is on the inside of those cloaks. Um, I think in some of the historical ones which have been acquired, um, there can be um, many, many decades, well, there's many different pieces of a cloak that are being re-sewn and added to and taken from and added to um, over, um, the, over a person's lifetime. But this one is put up in contrast, not to contrast, um, indigenous knowledge, but to show um, the idea of mapping country, how it exists as an experiential knowledge. Um, also how, you know, um, in this case, the country that is being mapped, which is a river, has these incredibly important um, spatial arrangements of knowledge, which are depicted and the, the knowledges as they sort of um, are layered across each other. Um, the story of the trade routes across the country is something that comes out in a lot of these works as well. Um, materials such as, you know, this in the top case, it's pearl shell from Broome on the larger map. This is um, a very um, older, which probably needs to be updated in some ways, but map of the, the types of materials which were, which were commodities as such this economic exchange of materials between um, different nations and the, um, the long-term relationships which were involved in those exchanges. Um, it's really trying to break down this continental picture of Australia um, and the hard maps, the way that maps um, delineate you know, our state-based thinking and to give us more of an environmental understanding of the relationships as the land creates them. Um, you know, map making has errors. When we look at some of the earliest maps of what was thought to be Australia, um, like in this example, for example, um, which shows New Guinea mistakenly joined to Northern Australia. Um, and then contrasting that with um, contemporary works made by the beautiful um, La Perouse community members who have been producing these for more than a century. Um, we're really breaking down the way that experiential knowledge and knowledge of country um, is meant to be taught or understood or experienced. Um, lastly, there's a long-term project that we're sort of having lots of discussions about developing further in terms of this remarkable story from um, Broome of old man Wig, uh, Roy Wigan and the story of his father who was washed out to sea for three days. Um, and the incredible um, st stories of that um, miraculous journey back to the coast, which are represented in over a thousand Ilma, which were produced in that region in a very short space of time. Um, to be able to show the performative way that knowledge is shared amongst community members today is an incredible um, responsibility and something that the museum doesn't take lightly in terms of 
the ongoing relationship with community members and the different uh, Aboriginal nations which are represented in the exhibition. Um, so I think that's about it in terms of a very, very brief um, overview of what we've attempted to do in the Shaped by the Sea exhibition. And um, I really hope you get the chance to come and see it or um, there will be a different, there's an incredible new website that we're producing, which is hopefully another way that people can uh, interact with and see the way that the exhibition, you know, to engage with the exhibition over its life. But being a, um, a new permanent space, it should be up the next couple of years. So I really hope to see us all in Sydney, um, engaging and visiting with the exhibition as we move into this exciting new space of redeveloping some of our permanent galleries. I think I'll just leave it at that, but thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Matt. That's fantastic. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? And I think, yeah. David, you can sort out the spotlighting. There we go. That was fabulous. Thank you, David. Um, wonderful, wonderful, Matt. A couple of things just jumped out at me. Um, I, a beautiful comment, um, watercraft as a kind of um, experiential knowledge. And I just thought that's just a really love, I love that concept. I've always had a great interest, as I'm sure you know, um, in mobility, particularly Indigenous mobility. And um, there's this kind of perception out there, a broadly held perception that Aboriginal people are rooted in place, that they, they tend to be stuck, you know, <laughs> stuck, in, stuck <laughs> in place. And in fact, the very notions of Aboriginality actually come, become tied to that, that very uh, lack of mobility. And this, when you start to look at um, particularly maritime equipment, maritime vessels, watercraft, and of course, maritime industries, that's when you see, you know, Indigenous people, indig often Indigenous men, but, you know, not certainly not exclusively Indigenous men working and moving and engaging with often in this case, the colonial, the imposition of a colonial system within that, within the, the maritime industry. So that was just, I loved that. That was fantastic. Um, and then I, the other thing that really struck me was the idea that the Oreed, um, the Charles Eaton. Um, yeah. <laughs> that is the first the first um, repatriation? I thought that was just terrific. What a lovely way of thinking about it, and it gives oh. you that it draws that lovely connection between the present and the past. So that's I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to see how this all comes up. Um, and I know I know you're very aware of the work that Ian McNiven has done, but his work yeah. on the Charles Eaton in particular, um, the concept of Sarup and the people being, in a sense, being in a liminal zone, not being alive, not being dead, and they have yeah, to be dispatched yeah. one way or the other, and they, of course, are dispatched into the not being alive. Um, so, look, I just that was a beautiful talk. I, I really highly recommend the National Maritime Museum to everyone because it is fantastic. Um, we've had the absolute, as I said before, the absolute privilege of starting to, to think about doing some work there. And it's just a, it's a really exciting place. And I think it's incredibly proactive of the National Maritime Museum to engage someone like Matt, who's got these wonderful ideas about the past, the present, contemporary art, how it affects and works with the historical records, just lovely. So I've got a few people here. Um, I don't think I've got any questions yet, but please, um, Please do either put your hand up or ask a question um, or um, pop something into the chat if you like. Uh, it's <clears throat> The idea is, uh, unfortunately, Leone was meant to be doing the discussions tonight and she has succumbed to the wicked lurgy. And anyone in Melbourne knows at the moment, well, this may well be all over the countryside, but I'm afraid there's a lot of people getting rather unwell. Uh, at the moment so she wasn't able to to be here but did anyone in our audience have any comments or questions for Matt no well I can just keep talking because I'm very well, no. <laughs> thank you because that idea of the fluid nature of identity and you know people not being rooted in one place is something that I've been really exploring a lot too um it's you know it's 
fascinating to think of people's mobility through that way and you know to challenge us so much absolutely it's so and it's it's such an easy one to, to for people to slip into and when you said you know working with the new the school's curriculum I mean, that's a really great thing that people can start to, to think about as well. That can go into the curriculum. It's not just people being, you know, in one place. They're, they're moving, they're engaging. And when you show things like um, the distribution of various um, tool types, whether it be fish hooks or the other, or trade networks, I mean, mm. there's that beautiful image that the National Gallery of Victoria purchased um, last year, I believe it was, of Torres Strait Islanders coming right down the coast. Um, in It's a, it's a um, Harden Melville uh, painting, okay. magnificent yeah. painting. It's just beautiful. It's actually a real feature at the NGV. Um, if anyone's in Melbourne, NGV uh, at the uh, Potter Centre have, have it on display. I think it's almost on permanent display. And it, But it shows Torres Strait Islanders coming right down the, the Queensland coast. Oh, yeah, coast. I know the one. Yeah. That's and they're, you know. It's stunning, you know, uh, and that, it, but that one's particularly interesting too. Is because they're they're harvesting material off a, a shipwreck, so it really it really does show you these, you know, how important this maritime stuff was. Oh, in oh. fact, David's very kindly just popped it into the um <laughs> into the chat, so other people can have a look at it if you like. <laughs> Um, yeah, the trade network story is remarkable too. I mean, one of the earliest Papunya paintings is depiction of pearl shell. Yes, it was, you know, uh, you know, to, just to, there's so many interconnections that break down the sort of those rigid barriers between different parts of the country, which we have yep. that, you know, I'm sure people were um, <laughs> traveling incredible distances, you know, <laughs> you know personally and generationally. I'm just going to very quickly, I will share my screen just for a microsecond so everyone can have a quick look. The, unfortunately, the, the link didn't seem to be working just then, um, but I will, no, I'll do this one and share it and you can have a look at that while we keep talking. So that's the Harden Melville image um, of the Torres Strait Islander men in their canoe and they're actually harvesting his you can see it. I'm pointing at my screen. You can't see me pointing at my screen. <laughs> <laughs> I do that all the time. So um, I'm thinking, uh, yeah, that's it's a lovely example of exactly what you're talking about. But Jane has oh. asked a question. Um, Jane Lydon. Hi, Jane. Um, will you include Indigenous movement on European ships, thinking of whalers um, in the WA or East Coast like my work? Um, she's on her phone. So apologies oh. for not speaking. <laughs> um. Very much so. This is actually only phase one in terms of a three-stage redevelopment exhibition concepts. The next ones are encounters and waves of history. So um, thanks for that heads up because, I'd, yeah, I'd be meaning to get in touch with you as well, Jane, <laughs> um, on all sorts of areas of research with your photo amazing photographic work. But, um, God, the way that the, the shipping history, I mean, especially if we look at the um, South Sea Islanders, for example, I mean, mm -hmm. this year is the 175th anniversary of Benjamin Boyd bringing South Sea Islanders to New South Wales, not Queensland. You know, there's a deeper way that that story needs to be contextualised too, which is tied, you know, Benjamin Boyd's um, father was heavily involved in the Atlantic slave trade. So there's no excuse that he didn't know what he was establishing here, I don't think. And it's important to, um, you know, I think what a really exciting area for me is the the way Australia is situated in the Pacific. You know, we, you know, if in museums overseas, they sort of represent Aboriginal and Pacific Islanders as Oceania. Mm -hmm. um, and we've created that artificial border ourselves as well, in terms of there's um, a fascinating story to unpack there about Pacific networks and even knowledge of Pacific Islander peoples. I mean, if you look at the Papua New Guinean um, uh, outriggers heading to north to Cape York, for example, I mean, they are possibly trade works which predate the sea level rise, which created the Torres Strait. <laughs> um, you know, we're um, unfairly um, 
you know, stopping that flow of knowledge, well, you know, understanding how people um, lived on the continent in what we call the deep time period, but which isn't the deep time for many contemporary community members. And um, yeah, it's just through creating these artificial barriers that we've actually blocked our own attempts to, to understand better our people's yeah. relationships to each other. And, all, and of course, going back a little bit to some of the work that Ian's done, Ian's work um, looking at the Coral Sea interaction sphere um, and that, that lovely, which is exactly what you're talking about, the Papua New Guinea and connections to Torres Strait and all the rest, um, that's the centrepiece of an exhibition that's currently on at the, in fact, I think it may have only closed a couple of days ago at the um, Queensland, the tropical um, Queensland. Yeah museum but it's starting in August it moves to and it will be opening up at the Queensland Museum so all these sorts of issues and questions around maritime engagement and involvement it's really starting to it's it's kind of, it's become really cutting edge and we're mm -hmm. really starting to think about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, moving as 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 mariners as it were. Mm. Yeah. The watercraft that first brought them here more than 65, 80,000 years ago. I mean, you know, yeah. what do you know about that? I mean, that, I don't think that challenges the, the idea that Aboriginal people has always been here because, you know, the land is an ancestor in that sense. You know, they, they can complement each other if it's told through an Indigenous yeah. lens. I completely agree with that, Matt. And I'm really interested in and something that I've been thinking about a lot and I've written I've, I've given a couple of presentations on it because I think it's an important question what did people have that they put into those and we, these must have been sophisticated pieces of watercraft to have negotiated yeah. from Southeast Asia to us to Northern Australia they were sophisticated um, you, you you don't have it's not a log canoe let's be no. <laughs> a log canoe. so but what do they have in that canoe what is the what's the water situation what's the food situation what's the population we know these are deliberate intentional uh colonizing events they're not it's not just a case of people being blown off course that's just the modeling tells us that's not the case but what's fascinating to me is what's the mindset what's the what's the intellectual you know the cultural and intellectual baggage that people have with them in those canoes that set them off you know it, it's like I mean frankly it's it's like going to the moon was <laughs> in the 1960s you know in the in 1960 65,000 years ago you're just you're heading off into unknown territory but you must have you must be you must have a set of intellectual questions you're asking these are utterly modern human beings yeah, I find that fascinating. I could, yeah, just explore that all day. Or, you know, it's, <laughs> we just don't know enough. I don't know enough. But, I, you know, there's some, hopefully some great work we're being done out there exploring that can help tell us some answers to that. Absolutely. This has been absolutely fantastic, Matt. I, I knew it would be, but it's, it's <laughs> been even better than I thought it was going to be. So it's just oh. beautiful. And I, I can't wait to see the exhibition. Um, you're quite right. We... Our, as, as you were well aware, our team was up in Sydney and we all fell madly in love with um, Alex Tapodi's uh, Dungal carving. That's just, it, it's beyond words. It is just magnificent. So I can't wait to see it uh, again and indeed the whole new exhibition. So um, I think the only thing I've got left to do now is David's going to put up a slide for us. And this is to remind you all that our next seminar will be on the 16th of June, uh, it's going to be, it's actually a week earlier than normal um, because <laughs> um, I'm very pleased to say that after two years of having had our feet nailed to the floor, the Global Encounters Network team are actually heading off to Europe to do some research and give some conference papers and seminars. So it's very exciting. Um, so next, next seminar in June, in the 16th of June, is the historian and curator Sophie Couchman. Sophie's going to be tracing the myth that the Chinese discovered Australia with Lily, uh, our very own Yuli, Lily Yulianti Farid as the discussant. Uh, then followed in, in July with Mike Rowland, uh, one of our affiliates, and then later in the year, Annie Clark and Jane Lydon. So, I mean, 
there's a pretty a pretty impressive group of people that we have to talk for to you through our seminar series. So I hope you can all make it. And uh, thank you so much, Matt. Thoroughly enjoyed tonight. Oh, it was a real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me along. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Oh, well, I hope that went well. This it was feel great. Feel free to put it up or share it around or anything. And yeah, Thank you. No, that was contact. terrific. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, always pass on my contact details. It was, it's yep. a great network you've got there. <laughs> Thank you. It's Thanks, really, Matt. yeah. That's, that's really okay. Looking for, I'm still looking to where we take all of this, you know, we're going to, uh, our trip to Arnhem Land is going to be very exciting. <laughs> well, if you keep in, if you spot any watercraft over there, get some photos for me. Yeah, <laughs> oh, be, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm very keen to follow up on international collections at some point in the future. So just, oh, yeah. Well, that's really good because next week, um, I think, oh, look, I've, I don't even know when it is. In a couple of weeks' time, I've got a two two evening symposium with colleagues in Germany who are looking at Australian Indigenous plant materials in museums. Mm. But the yeah. plant museum, the plant materials, Matt, are all um, objects. So they're either baskets, so they could easily oh. be watercraft. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. That's so awesome. I look for that as well. Okay. A lovely, I loved, lovely. Thank you so I loved, much. I love to the start, I love the... um. Use the word Skylands, I think you said. Sky worlds. Sky <laughs> worlds yeah. Beautiful. Um, while you were talking, I, I've downloaded a couple of articles by Philip A. Park talking about Sky worlds. So remarkable work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Mm. I'm gonna Fantastic. get right into it. Lovely. Okay, go for okay. it. And thanks again. <laughs> I'll be in touch. Welcome. Have a great trip. I'll Thank see you, you soon. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for seasoning. Bye. Oh Bye. I'll catch you later then. So yeah, have a great trip overseas. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll be in touch. Yep, fantastic. I'm off to get some dinner. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.